Hello, my name is Dr. Oliver Botar, and I'm a professor of art history at the School of Art of the University of Manitoba. And I'm the curator of this exhibition, Bauhaus Canada 101. This exhibition was conceived to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus, which was a school of design and art, and later on architecture, in Weimar, Germany, and then it moved to Dessau, Germany, and finally ended up in Berlin. It was founded in 1919 by Walter Gropius, who was a German architect. And this school, which only um, lasted for about 14 years before it was closed down, essentially closed down by the National Socialists, um, has exercised an outsized influence on artistic developments, design, architecture, and pedagogy during the 20th century. And in fact, there have been memorial exhibitions throughout the centenary year, 2019, all over the world. As far as I know, this is the only substantial exhibition to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus in Canada. And what I've tried to do in this exhibition is to, first of all, uh, give a kind of primer of the Bauhaus itself, but also then to introduce themes that deal with the 100th anniversary of the influence of the Bauhaus in Canada. So the title of the exhibition, Bauhaus Canada 101, says a few things about the exhibition. First of all, it's not Bauhaus Canada 100, and that's because we couldn't fit this exhibition into our, into the, into our 2019 program, and therefore it's 101. But the 101 designation is also, I think, appropriate for an exhibition which is uh, quite didactic and documentary in nature because it's designed to support teaching at the, um, at the School of Art, teaching on, uh, in architecture and, and also at the University of Manitoba, I should say, teaching in architecture, teaching in graphic design, teaching in the fine arts, in pedagogy, um, and, and so on. So it's the 101st anniversary in 2020 this year, hence the title. But 101 also suggests this introductory nature of the exhibition. And in fact, there's a, there's a section of the exhibition which introduces the Bauhaus itself as it developed in Germany um, uh, throughout the 1920s and into the early 1930s. The exhibition is divided into three sections. The first section is about architecture. The second, ex the second section is about design and pedagogy. And the third section is about art. Let me just say also a few things about, the, uh, about how the exhibition came together. Originally, the idea for this exhibition was born about 20 years ago. I was working with a colleague uh, of mine uh, Dr. Anna Hudson, who was then a curator at the Art Gallery of Ontario. She is now a professor of art history at York University in uh, North York in Toronto. So uh, this is the realization at that time we couldn't realize the exhibition, and I have realized the exhibition in quite a different form uh, now. The exhibition has been sponsored not only by the School of Art Gallery here at the University of Manitoba, but also by, the, by Arthur and Judy Dreisch of Ottawa, who were major funders of the exhibition, and the Salgo Trust for Education in New York, who also supported the exhibition in many ways, and of course the lenders. The exhibition begins with a video entitled uh, City Dreamers. It's a film made in 2019, and it's about four North American women architects who contributed significantly to the development of architecture, of landscape architecture, and of urban design in North America. It just so happens that this film, in this film, three of the protagonists are Canadians. It just so happens that Denise Scott Brown, who you're seeing right now, is not one of those Canadians. But the other three Canadian women who, uh, who are featured in this film are Phyllis Lambert, who uh, uh, Cornelia Oberlander, and Blanche Van Ginkel. And those three women all trained with, uh, at American universities with uh, professors who had been at one time professors at the Bauhaus. So let's take a look inside the exhibition. The exhibition begins uh, with a section, as I mentioned, on the Bauhaus itself. There are actually a couple of displays in this regard. One of the displays is here, and we see some works by a Canadian who was um, uh, active at the Bauhaus and moved here in the 1950s. Then we have a display of the original series of Bauhaus books, which is very unusual to have, actually, 
uh, a display of almost all the books with their original dust jackets. If we turn around to this wall over here, we see the main display uh, concerning the Bauhaus itself, and this follows the Bauhaus, this display follows the Bauhaus through its 14-year existence from 1919 and the publication of the, of the manifesto of the Bauhaus through um, the 1923 Bauhaus exhibition, the Bauhaus journal, uh, a whole bunch of photography in relation to the Bauhaus, some art in relation to the Bauhaus as well, right through to its uh, demise in Berlin in 1933. And in fact, we even include a postcard from the period of National Socialism when the Bauhaus building was transformed into a uh, kind of a training school for Nazi officials. If we come around over here, the first display in the exhibition is surprisingly a display of Bix Pickles. You might ask yourself, why do we have Bix Pickles here on display? Well, the reason is that among the three Bauhaus graduates who settled in Canada, I mentioned one already, Andor Weininger was his name, his wife, Eva Fernbach Weininger, who was a furniture designer. The third person was a man by the name of Werner David Feist, who was a photographer and graphic designer at the Bauhaus. He moved to Montreal around 1951 and became a prominent graphic designer there. And among his early designs is the uh, is label and the logo for Bix Pickles, which is still in use to this very day. In fact, at the opening of the exhibition a uh, few weeks back, we served every uh, um, we served every flavor of Bix Pickles we could get our hands on. And here are the empty jars to prove that point. We also have an early. Um, advertising design by David Feist for Bix Pickles from the 1950s, and we also have a facsimile of a work by the Hungarian Bauhaus professor Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, who also figures quite prominently in this exhibition. And this draw, it's a facsimile of a drawing in the family's collection, which is entitled Through Canada. And this is a kind of motto for the exhibition, because in fact, the way that things worked out is that when the Bauhaus was shut down in 1933, many of the Bauhausler, as they were called in German, Bauhausler, about one third of them actually emigrated, left Germany. Some because they were Jewish, some because they were left wing, some just because they did not want to live in Nazi Germany or work for the Nazi state. So almost all of them, or many of them I should say, went to the United States. Almost none of them came to Canada. And even some of the two of the ones who came to Canada, and I'm mentioning Andor Weininger and his wife, Eva Fernbach Weininger, as soon as they could, they headed for the United States. Why was that? Well, Canada was relatively speaking, relative to the United States, a backwater at that time. It was not very friendly to the arts and to architecture and design. And so uh, people tended to move to the United States where they received a lot more support from universities, from uh, companies. They had a lot more opportunity to design buildings and so on. So what happened was that several of the major, two of the actual directors of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius and then Mies van der Rohe, who was also an architect, they moved to the United States. Mies van der Rohe setting up shop, teaching architecture at the Illinois Institute of Design in Chicago. And Walter Gropius and one of the other Bauhaus graduates, Marcel Breuer, who's famous for having invented stainless, uh, 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 stainless steel, tub tub tubular stainless steel furniture, they started teaching at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just next to Boston. Those two schools became the conduits, so to speak, for Bauhaus ideas to enter Canada, the two main conduits. And in fact, the University of Manitoba played a major role in this because the Faculty of Architecture, or then the School of Architecture, later the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba, sent many of its graduates to both Harvard and to the IIT in Chicago to study with Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, and Marcel Breuer. Some of the graduates were also sent to do their graduate work at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the Bauhaus associate, Gerrit Kepesch, who had been Laszlo Moholy-Nagy's assistant, taught the foundation course for architects. There was a third important school in the United States, uh, or actually there were, there were two more important schools in the United States, one was uh, Black Mountain College in North Carolina. As far as we know, only two uh, Canadians studied there, uh, but that's where both Al um, Joseph Albers and Annie Albers taught, 
very successfully. Later on, Joseph Elbers taught at the, uh, at the School of Art at Yale University um, in New Haven, Connecticut. And the fourth school, which was also very important, was the so-called New Bauhaus that was founded in Chicago in 1937 by Laszlo Moholy-Nagy. And a number of Canadians studied there who later on, as we'll see, influenced uh, the development of art in Canada uh, from the 1940s up until the 1970s. So on this wall, I've gathered some photographs uh, concerning uh, Mies van der Rohe, the architect that I mentioned, was the third and, la and final director of the Bauhaus in Germany. As I also mentioned, he moved to IIT in Chicago and started teaching there. He also had a very successful architectural practice. And as I mentioned, a number of our graduates um, at the, the, of the School of Architecture and later the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba studied with Mies van der Rohe, and they brought their ideas back to Canada. This little display is about Mies van der Rohe himself and about the buildings that he built in Canada, but also about Phyllis Lambert. Phyllis Lambert, uh, with roots in Manitoba, family roots in Manitoba, was a, and still is, a very prominent uh, um, advocate for architecture. She's the founder of the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. She also studied with Mies van der Rohe, and she convinced her father, Samuel Bronfman, who was the CEO of Seagram's company, uh, the major um, um, alcohol like drink firm, uh, to hire Mies van der Rohe to design their headquarters on Park Avenue in New York, the Seagram Building, which has be since become an icon of modern architecture. So here is a photograph of Phyllis Lambert with the Seagram Building, and here she is with her father, with Mies van der Rohe, here she is with Mies van der Rohe as well, and with other officials in New York um, during the construction. This is the mid-1950s. Come the late, now fast forward to the mid-1960s and late 1960s, she convinced her father again and her father's develop, her family's development company, Cadillac Fairview, to engage Mies van der Rohe in a number of, in three developments in Canada, the Toronto Dominion Centre in Toronto, the uh, Westmount Square in Montreal, and the Nuns Island development in, also in Montreal. And here are more photographs of the TD Centre in Toronto. What I've done on this wall is I brought together a whole bunch of photographs, most of them by Panda and Associates of Toronto, and particularly Henry Kalin, a graduate of the School of Architecture here at the University of Manitoba, who became the most important architectural photographer of modernism here in Winnipeg. So these photographs um, uh, uh, display images of buildings that were designed inspired by Mies van der Rohe. Some of them were, they were all designed by University of Manitoba graduates. Some of, most of them were designed by University of Manitoba graduates who went on to do graduate work either with Mies van der Rohe in Chicago or with Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer in, uh, at Harvard. But all of them are inspired by Mies van der Rohe. In this display case, I've gathered together some documents and this exhibition, as I mentioned, as a documentary, um, as a didactic exhibition for a university gallery is document heavy. So if you come to see the show, you'll have, there'll be a lot of books on display and a lot of um, uh, do other kinds of documents as well. And here in this case, I've highlighted a particular building at the Illinois Institute of Technology designed by Mies van der Rohe called Crown Hall. It is actually the, the architecture school at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And this building was hugely influential, actually, I would say, throughout the world. Here in, um, in Canada, it exercised an outside influence because of these graduates of the University of Manitoba uh, School of Architecture who went on to do graduate work, including David Haid, who actually worked on this building, but who ended up staying in the United States, but a number of other ones as well, um, um, uh, Cecil Blankstein and, um, and Isidore Koop, who also worked, who were studying with Mies van der Rohe when Crown Hall was being designed, and they actually came back, and for example, in this building, which was designed as the new headquarters of Green Blankstein Russell, one of the most important architectural firms in Canada, they designed a kind of version of Crown Hall and finished the building actually before Crown Hall itself was completed. So these Canadians from Winnipeg had kind of an in on this new architecture that Mies van der Rohe was engaged in producing in Chicago. So they were really ahead of the curve in this respect. And if we go down this row of buildings, the Norquay building in Winnipeg, 
Britannia House on, um, on Broadway in Winnipeg, the Ottawa uh, uh, Union Station, uh, uh, John, C. Park and, John B. Park and Associates headquarters and offices in Toronto, the Russell Building here in Winnipeg, um, Manitoba Health Building, um, Don Mills Shopping Center, Phyllis Lambert's own Sadie Bronfman Center in Montreal, which she designed, uh, Smith Carter Associates, another important architectural firm in Winnipeg, um, and so on through the airport and uh, even the Mendel Art Gallery in Saskatoon, all these buildings are examples of structures that were inspired to greater or lesser extents by Mies van der Rohe's architecture. Now, if we move over to this display case and this wall, we're focusing here on domestic architecture. The other wall I just spoke about was really about institutional architecture, um, businesses, uh, shopping centers, uh, uh, academic structures, and so on. This display case and this wall is about domestic architecture. And this domestic architecture was inspired more, more than anything else by the architecture of Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer. I mentioned earlier that these two men founded or started to teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1937-38. They also founded an architectural firm the work that they got was mostly domestic architecture, houses and cottages, mostly in Massachusetts and in, um, and, in, uh, and in Connecticut, and elsewhere as well. One of the other places where they designed a house was in Duluth, Minnesota, which is not that far from Winnipeg. And the man who, uh, who, who commissioned that house later on commissioned a cottage for an island in Dryberry Lake in Northwestern Ontario just east of Lake of the Woods. And this cottage, which has previously been unphotographed and unpublished, is this one here. And we, for the first time, are showing images of this cottage, which is a beautiful complex, actually. It's actually a fishing camp on this island. It's now being used as a cottage. And we have photographs by Professor Herbert Enns here of that cottage. The other, the other structures on this wall, and you can see that there's a central row of photographs, but they're also kind of superscripts and subscripts, is what I call them, of of um, other types of images that are not framed. Here is a house designed by James Donahue, who was an architect uh, hired to teach architecture here at the University of Manitoba in 1947, I believe. This is his own house, the second house that he designed. It's very much, very much inspired uh, by the houses of Walter Gropius and Josef Breuer, uh, of um, Marcel Breuer of a couple of decades before. But there are other houses here by Ernie Smith, uh, and by uh, Morley Blankstein and, and others. There is an exception to the um, domestic architectural theme here, and that is a northern sales building in uh, Winnipeg, which is inspired by uh, Mies van der Rohe's uh, famous Mar Barcelona Pavilion for the Barcelona World's Fair in Spain in 1929. We then have a video here, or a video screen, which shows three films. There are three films by Laszlo Moholynek. He was, was also, who was a photographer, an artist, a new media artist, and also a filmmaker. These three films all have a Canadian connection. The film that you see playing right now is about the, a conference of international modernist architects that took place during the summer of 1933 on a boat that sailed from Marseille in France to Athens, Greece. And on this boat trip, Moholy Nod was, con was commissioned to make a film. And while he was making this film, there were two Canadians on this boat. One was a man by the name of Wells Coates, an architect, and another architect by the name of Hazen Size. Wells Coates, so his family was from Vancouver, although he was born in Tokyo. Hazen Size was from Montreal. Hazen Size actually photographed Moholy Nod while he was making this film, and we have two of these photographs of Moholy Nod on display here. So this is a really nice conjunction here. Here is a photograph of Moholy Nod holding his film camera, and here we see the actual film, uh, the final cut of the film that Moholy Nod actually made. The other two films that are on this monitor include one um, which is entitled uh, uh, The London, uh, sorry, The New Architecture in the London Zoo, which Moholy Nod actually collaborated with, Hazen Size with, on making. So we actually now know that he collaborated on one of his films with a Canadian architect, Hazen Size. The third film is called Do Not Disturb, and that is a film that was made by Moholy Nagy's students at the Institute of Design in Chicago 
1945, including one of the Canadian students there who stars in that film, Do Not Disturb, uh, by the name of Richard Filipowski. We move on here to some more architecture inspired by the Bauhaus, including a bunch of uh, the Bauhaus professors in the United States, including a number of designs by the firm Green Blankstein Russell. If we come around the corner here, we will see the final section of the final display of the architecture section in this exhibition. This section of the first part of the exhibition is devoted to two Métis architects, an Alberta architect by the name of Douglas Cardinal and a Winnipeg by the name of Etienne Gaboury. And we demonstrate in this display that both were inspired in various ways by Bauhaus architecture and Bauhaus architectural concepts. Douglas Cardinal, by the third director of the Bauhaus, who I haven't mentioned yet, his name was Hannes Meyer. He was a left-wing Swiss architect who was very interested in incorporating environmental conditions into the design of buildings, such as insulation, the lay of the land, the prevailing winds, uh, and so on and so forth. And one of his students actually taught Douglas Cardinal at the University of Texas at Austin. So Douglas Cardinal begins his early designs in the Bauhaus tradition, and it's only after that that he develops into this very prominent organicist architect who incorporates traditional indigenous concepts of how we should live and how buildings should be, should be built into his design. And I'm featuring designs, and I'm featuring here what I consider to be his masterpiece, and many other people do as well, which is uh, St. Mary's Church built in Red Deer in the mid-1960s in Alberta. And you can see it's a very different, it looks very different from the more boxy Bauhaus architecture because he's incorporating indigenous concepts of circularity and organicism into his architecture. But what's important to remember is some of these ideas he would have received from his professor, Hugo Leipziger Price, who himself was a student of Hannes Meyer, who promoted organic art ideals and architectural design. The other architect I'm, uh, on display here, Etienne Gaboury, also began inspired by a modernist, a Le Corbusier, after he graduated from the University of Manitoba. He went to France, studied with, Le Corbusier, or actually apprenticed with the famous French modernist Le Corbusier, but he also was inspired by Mies van der Rohe in his early designs, one of which was on display on the, the wall that I showed you earlier opposite this wall. But very soon, he moved into much more organicist mode of architecture, um, uh, the, most, the, the, the best known of which is his design for um, uh, uh, L'Église du Précieux Saint, uh, Holy Blood Church, uh, which actually looks like a combination of a teepee, a nautilus shell, and maybe even a boat. This design by Etienne Gaboury is for the Civic Center in St. Boniface, which is currently for sale. Let's hope it's preserved properly, and which was inspired by some other types of architecture, particularly the brutalist style that Marcel Breuer engaged in once he left Harvard, moved to New York, and set up his own architectural firm there. Also part of the architecture section is this display case concerning the so-called British Bauhaus. The British Bauhaus is the term that is being used nowadays to refer to about a three or four year period in a, in, in a certain suburb of, of London called Hempstead, where a number of Bauhaus emigres congregated. And uh, these included Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, and uh, his uh, second wife, Sybil Moholy-Nagy as well. Uh, and also in London at that time was Moholy-Nagy's assistant, Gerard Kepesh. And there were others as well. But what's interesting here is that they congregated in one particular building, and that building known as the Isaacon Building, uh, you can see here, or the Lawn Road Flats, there, there are images of it, was designed by none other than the Canadian architect Wells Coates, who was living in London during the 1930s. So this building, which is considered to be one of the most important modernist structures, domestic structures in Britain, and is now a national historic site, as you can see uh, for English heritage, on this memorial plate, which looks exactly like the round blue uh, plates and uh, metal enamel plates, which are put on heritage buildings in, in England, um, was built in the mid 1930s and was designed for young professionals who didn't necessarily want to cook for themselves. They didn't necessarily need a lot of space. So these are relatively small apartments with a communal kitchen, a communal kitchen that later on was redesigned by Marcel Breuer into a bar. 
the Isacon Bar, it was called. And this building was really, this building structure was really interesting because not only did these former Bauhaus people, these Bauhäuser live there, but also resident was a certain um, novelist by the, way, by the name of Agatha Christie, who you may have, may have heard of, and no fewer than nine certified spies, British spies for the Soviet government. So it was actually a really interesting kind of hothouse atmosphere um, in this building at that time. But these Bauhaus people did live there. They actually had fairly successful careers in, 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 uh, in Britain. But the United States, uh, various organizations in the United States caught wind of these, of these Bauhaus uh, alumni uh, living in London, and they were poached one by one to go to the United States and teach there. As I mentioned, Gropius and Breuer to Harvard, and eventually Moholy Nod to the, the a new Bauhaus in Chicago. So the Canadian connection here is uh, Wells Coates. I'd now like to move on to the second section of the exhibition, which is devoted to design and pedagogy. Let's start with this little display about Marshall McLuhan. In Winnipeg, we're very proud of the fact that Marshall McLuhan grew up here, he went to uh, school here, and he, and he did his first undergraduate degree in English here at the University of Manitoba. What's not that well known about, about Marshall McLuhan was that he was strongly inspired in his concepts concerning media theory by Laszlo Moholy Nagy. Some of that inspiration was direct through Moholy Nagy's books, such as um, The New Vision, which apparently McLuhan used as a textbook in the first English course that he taught at his first job in St. Louis, Missouri. But later on, when he collaborated with another, a fellow Torontonian, uh, Edmund Carpenter, when he was teaching, when both of them were teaching at the University of Toronto in the 1950s, they collaborated on a journal entitled Explorations, and in particular on a special issue of that journal that was entitled the Verbi Voco Visual uh, Issue. And in that issue, McLuhan actually used a photograph from one of Moholy Nadia's recently published books, Vision in Motion, uh, as an illustration uh, for that book. And I could go on about Moholy Nadia's influence on McLuhan. Let me just mention one idea, the idea that media are the extensions of man, as McLuhan put it at that time. This is an idea which, he, which was inspired by ideas uh, uh, put forward by Moholy Nadia in his books, A New Vision and Vision in Motion. Let's swing around now to this display over here, because this is actually a display on the new Bauhaus that I just mentioned. So on the wall, we have several works that are connected with the new Bauhaus, most particularly this original design for a light modulator by Laszlo Moholy done in 1941 when he was living uh, in Chicago and teaching at the new Bauhaus. Here is his book, Vision in Motion, which I mentioned earlier, which not only inspired Marshall McLuhan, but Marshall McLuhan and Edmund Carpenter actually borrowed an image from it for this special issue of their magazine, Explorations. Next to Laszlo Mohinagy's work is the work by Richard Filipowski. Richard Filipowski was one of the most prominent students to graduate from the new Bauhaus, the, later on the Institute of Design. And he was a Canadian from Toronto, although he did stay in the United States after he graduated from the school. This is a work by him inspired by Moholy Nod. You can see the similarities between the two works from the late 1940s. Also on display in the wall here is a late drawing from uh, the late 1950s by Arthur Lismer. Some of you who are Canadian may know that Arthur Lismer was one of the founding members of the Group of Seven, the iconic nationalist uh, group of artists out of Toronto uh, who found, were founded in the, late, in the early 1920s. What's less known about Arthur Lismer is that he was a pioneer of children's art education in this country. He traveled around Canada preaching the gospel of children's art education. One of the biggest influences on his theories of children's art education was the work of the Austro-Bohemian Austro uh, children's art educator, Franz Cizek. And Cizek, not only was a well-known children's art educator, but he also toured an exhibition of his children's art around North America, and Arthur Lismer made sure that it came to the Art Gallery of Toronto, what was then the Art Gallery of Toronto, now the Art Gallery of Ontario, and was put on display there. It was at the, it was at the Art Gallery of Toronto where Arthur Lismer taught children 
art, art in the, during the 1930s. And he founded something called the Children's Art Center there, near, near the Art Gallery of Toronto. This Children's Art Center had several Canadian artists who were teaching there, and Arthur Lismer admired Moholy Nadia's ideas of pedagogy from afar. Both of them were also inspired by the American philosopher and pedagogy specialist, John Dewey. As soon as Arthur Lismer heard that Laszlo Moholy Nadia had moved from London and opened his new Bauhaus in Chicago, Arthur Lismer went to visit him, they established a friendship, and Arthur Lismer started to send him students, including uh, a young artist by the name of Gordon Weber, and two young women by the name, uh, names of Irma Sutcliffe and Dorothy Medhurst. Gordon Weber studied at the New Bauhaus for a few years and was so successful there, Moholy Nod held him in very high regard that he uh, um, um, appointed him to lead the children's art classes, Saturday morning children's art classes uh, at the New Bauhaus. Irma Sutcliffe and Dorothy Medhurst studied for shorter periods, maybe a summer school or something like that. Then they came back to Toronto and they both became famous children's art educators, very influential children's art educators throughout the 1940s, the 50s, and right into the 1970s in Toronto. The new Bauhaus actually exercised an enormous influence on several areas of American culture. One of them was graphic design and the other was photography, but also furniture design. So really it was a very successful school, despite the fact that Moholy Nod himself died very young at the age of 51 of leukemia. So we, here we have a number of documents about that school. If we swing around here to this section, you'll see that there's a larger display here of furniture, of interior design, and of, uh, of, uh, of product design. So this section, is, continues to be about pedagogy and about design. We start this section with the display of thesis projects and one third year project by University of Manitoba students. This is before they went to graduate school in Chicago and Cambridge, Massachusetts. And what we want to demonstrate here is that the ideas of the, of the Bauhaus as it was filtered through the United States were actually seeping into pedagogy at the University of Manitoba itself before these students went to do graduate work in the United States. Because to reiterate, our, the, the, most of the influence of the Bauhaus in Canada came via the United States for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, which was that Canada was seen as a backwater at that time. There were far more opportunities for these uh, Germans and Hungarians and other Bauhaus alumni who went to the United States to, um, uh, to um, achieve gainful employment. The earliest example here is as early as 1944. This is the thesis project, pro project of Harry Zeidler, who was an Austrian Jewish uh, refugee who ended up in Canada and um, uh, studied architecture at the University of Manitoba. If you look at this design for an apartment building, you can see that it's absolutely in the Bauhaus style or the international style as it was known in the United States at that time. Very advanced modern, modernist design. Here we also have a design by Valdis Allers, who was a Latvian refugee, and you can see that it's a very modern design inspired actually by the architecture of Mies van der Rohe. This is from the, the uh, mid-19, early 1950s. The third architectural project, which, a student project, which I wanted to uh, mention here, is by none other than Etienne Gaboury, the architect I mentioned earlier, the Métis architect who designed the Pre uh, uh, Precious Blood Church. And if you look at his designs here, while they're very strongly colored, they are also very Miesian in their nature. The fourth project I want to note here is by Cynthia Bookbinder Coop. Cynthia Bookbinder Coop was one of the number of women who graduated from the interior design program at the University of Manitoba. And this program, founded by Joan Harland, was the first university level interior design program in the country, and it is still one of the most important. These women, and they were mostly women, there were some men as well who graduated from this program, a very famous example of being Grant Marshall, but the women, such as Margaret Stinson and uh, Cynthia Bookbinder Coop, um, really revolutionized interior design, not only in Winnipeg, but throughout the country. And in this 
early project is just a third year project, it's not even a, a thesis project, you can see how inspired she was by international modernist ideals. What we see behind me here is a display of modernist interior design in Winnipeg in particular. And this is actually the first time that I know of that such a display has been put together. The photographs again by, are by Henry Kalin, I should mention. Each of these represents either a domestic interior or an institutional interior, including the private home of Morley Blankstein, um, uh, the interiors of, the, of, of, um, of an office building in Winnipeg, the interiors of City Hall in Winnipeg, and of the International Airport, which we lost a few years ago. And all these designs, for example, let me take as an example, the designs for City Hall are by Margaret Stinson. And they are, um, to this day, they're, they are intact for the most part, and they are really excellent examples of, of modernist interior design. And in the display cases here, we have some material on the interior design program um, at the University of Manitoba Faculty of Architecture. Above me, we have a display of, uh, of photographs, of, of, um, of digital photographic reproductions of furniture design by James Donahue. So there's a separate story here I want to tell. James Donahue, originally from Regina, studied um, at the University of Minnesota. Then he went on to do his graduate work with Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. While he was studying there, he became interested in furniture design as well as in architecture. And having um, uh, Marcel Breuer as his, as his professor, he couldn't have, he was really studying with the best. Marcel Breuer, as I mentioned, was an innovator of furniture design. And actually, if you look at these two chairs here, this is one of his Marcel Breuer's early famous designs. It's called the Vasily chair. It's from the mid 1920s. And it's one of the first chairs that was made with tubular steel. And the advantage of tubular steel in the mid 1920s when most furniture was very heavy is that you could just lift it very easily. It was so light and you could move it around so you could rearrange your furniture to suit the new lifestyle of the 1920s in Germany. Here's another example of a chair by Marcel Breuer, also very light. This you could not do with heavy wooden furniture. This is the type of furniture that Marcel Breuer uh, taught about um, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. When James Donahue had completed his studies with Marcel Breuer uh, in, Cambridge, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he received an offer of employment, a number of offers of employment in Ottawa, Ontario. There, he worked at the National Research Council in the mid to late 1940s, first at the National Film Board, then the National Research Council. At the National Research Council, he started experimenting with materials. At that time, the Canadian government was promoting the use of wood in all kinds of things, in architecture and furniture design and product design and so on. So he experimented with bent plywood furniture. You can see that little stool there. Um, and also here's a wood chair with uh, linen webbing on it. But they also experimented with plastics. And in fact, they developed, he and his partner by the name of Simpson, developed the world's first um, uh, molded uh, uh, plastic chair. That is this chair here, this white chair you see here in this image with the children sitting on it over here. Unfortunately, not a single copy of this chair survives. However, James Donahue uh, continued to experiment with furniture. In 1947, he was hired to teach architecture at the University of Manitoba. He came to teach architecture here. However, he continued to experiment with furniture. And one of his most famous experiments is the so-called Winnipeg chair. That's this chair here, which is made of molded plywood, of bent plywood, with um, tubular steel bent uh, legs and upholstery. This chair happens to have, this actual copy of it happens to have the original upholstery on it. This chair was handmade by James Donahue and his students in the basement of the then architecture building. If we look at the other furniture here, we're looking at examples of um, Bauhaus design. These nesting tables or interconnecting tables are by Marcel Breuer and they have displays on them of furniture. And here we also have two chairs designed by Mies van der Rohe in the 1920s. So these display cases also feature typographic design. This display case 
um, features the work of Werner David Feist, who I mentioned earlier as the inventor of the Bix Pickle logo. So he's featured in one of these display cases. In this other display case, I feature the work of the women at the textile workshop at the original Bauhaus and their Canadian equivalents. So what happened at the Bauhaus in the 1920s was that the women were tended to be kind of pushed towards the textile workshop. Now, many women resisted this, and some ended up designing furniture, some ended up in the metal workshop, even studying architecture. In fact, there were women present in every workshop of the original Bauhaus, but still the textile workshop was where they really shined. Uh, that's where they were uh, in the majority. That's where the, uh, the director of that workshop, the master of that workshop was a woman as well. She was the only uh, so-called master to ever, a female master to ever have been employed by the Bauhaus. We have some photographs here, one by Werner David Feist of one of the women who actually worked in the textile workshop. His, her name was Greta Reichert. And we also have some documentation of the women's commune at Lowland in central Germany, which working in the Bauhaus tradition actually made textiles and as far as I know is still making textiles. And here is one of the examples from the 1960s from the Lowland women's commune in Germany. If we go back to this corner here, first of all, we have a, uh, a very high quality reproduction of a blanket designed by Gunther Stölzel. And Gunther Stölzel was the woman I mentioned earlier who was the so-called master of the textile workshop at the Bauhaus. This has just been reissued last year, uh, woven in uh, Switzerland, and we were lucky enough to get a copy of it here, or one example of it here for our exhibition. There's another chair here designed and built, hand-built in Winnipeg um, by Douglas Gilmore. In this corner, we have three items of furniture which are actually Canadian knockoffs of Marcel Breuer and and Mies van der Rohe designs. This is a Canadian knockoff of a Mies van der Rohe design. These are two knockoffs, uh, Canadian knockoffs of, a Marcel, of Marcel Breuer designs. We also have on the wall an example of typographical research by Ander Weininger, uh, which is based on a design from the 1920s, which he then completed in New York in the 1970s. We also have two teapots designed by Wilhelm Wagenfeld at the actual uh, in, during the 1920s and 1930s in uh, Germany for the Jena Glass Company, the heat-resistant glass company. And we also have examples from the advertising campaign in Germany during the 1930s that was carried out, executed by Laszlo Moholynag and his design studio. We also have a, um, a uh, metal um, platter designed by Marianne Brandt, who was the most prominent woman to have worked in the Bauhaus's uh, metal workshop. To conclude this section, I have two displays here. One of them is about Gerrit Kepesh at the, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I have a display about Kepesh and where he taught the foundation course for architects. Also included here are two, are, is an original letter by, uh, written by, um, by Ernie Smith to his friend Dennis Carter, describing this Hungarian, Gerrit Kepesh, and his heavy accent and him teaching this introductory course, but praising it just the same. Later on, Dennis Smith and Ernest Carter went on to form uh, the very prominent modernist architectural firm in Winnipeg, Smith Carter. The last display case is devoted to Herbert Beyer, Herbert Beyer was the other prominent Bauhaus person to have lived in the United States. He didn't teach at a university, but he founded the Aspen Institute in um, Aspen, Colorado, which became a very important think tank for design in the United States and internationally. While we don't know about direct Canadian contacts with the Aspen Institute, we do know that it was well known in Canada, as, and particularly in Winnipeg, not only because Herbert Beyer designed for Canadians, including this poster for the Mont Tremblant um, uh, 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 Resort in Quebec, but also we have a, an issue of the University of Manitoba Architectural Students Association magazine perspective, which is devoted to Aspen. We also have various examples of Herbert Beyer's book design 
uh, in this display case, including the design for the major exhibition on the Bauhaus that opened at the Art Gallery of Toronto in 1969. That's over here. And I'm gonna conclude the section with this chair designed by Marcel Breuer much later for the uh, Priory of St. John, the Monastery of St. John in Collegeville, Minnesota, only about a six hour drive from Winnipeg. And this is one of the uh, uh, chairs he designed there in the 1950s for that icon of brutalist architecture. We're actually very fortunate to have this. It belongs to uh, Professor Herbert Enns of the Faculty of Architecture. The third and final section of the exhibition is entitled Color, Light, Movement, Art. And it focuses on the fine arts that were produced um, uh, uh, in the thrall of various Bauhaus ideas. And I'd like to iterate, I'd like to emphasize here that the Bauhaus school in Germany was not a single unified, did not represent a single unified way of thinking about, about art, about architecture, about design, about pedagogy, about anything. It was a very multifarious institution. I've already alluded to this when I mentioned that uh, Mies van der Rohe had a certain very formalist type of architecture, very classical style of architecture. Walter Gropius had a very different style of architecture. And the third direct director of the Bauhaus, who was in between these two, Hannes Meyer, had a very organicist approach. This multiplicity was true of all aspects of the Bauhaus. I would say that there was one aspect of the Bauhaus which actually was kind of unified, and that was pedagogy. And in pedag by that I mean that the Bauhaus was very important for its, its, its innovative pedagogy, which was based on a long tradition of reform pedagogy that was international. And this reform pedagogy focused on the idea of learning by doing and project-based learning. So rather than teaching students to copy uh, the work of the masters, whether they be architects or artists, by drawing or by, by copying them in other ways, what at the Bauhaus, students in, all had to go through an introductory course, which was first taught by a, a Swiss man by the name of Johannes Itten, and then later on taught by Laszlo Moholinag and Josef Albers. And in this introductory course, this foundation course, the students were basically told to forget anything they had ever learned about art before and to start from scratch. And by that I mean to look, think about color theory, think about forms, experiment with materials, basically become a child again and play with materials, colors, forms, shapes, and so on in order to build up their artistic and design practice from the bottom up. So we will see some of that approach in the art that was made by Canadians who were inspired mostly indirectly by Bauhaus concepts. The most important figure here is Josef Albers. As I mentioned earlier, only two Canadians were known to have studied with Joseph Albers in the United States, once he had moved to the United States. One of them was Harry Zeidler, whose thesis project I talked about earlier from 1944 as being very important. And actually, Harry Zeidler was the first Canadian, grad, was the first graduate of the University of Manitoba to become an international star architect, if you like, like a star of the architecture world. He, that happened to him when he took his Bauhaus ideals to Australia and basically established modernist architecture in Australia. The other was Dorothea Rockburn from Montreal who didn't return to Canada. So the influences of Joseph Albers, which nevertheless were enormous on American art, particularly in the field of color field painting, came indirectly. Um, namely, through this book that Joseph Albers designed, the Interactions of Color. This is an enormous book with many, and I'm not using gloves here, do not try this at home, because this is a library copy, and in fact it's on display in such a way that it's accessible throughout the term of the exhibition to all um, interior design students and other students. But there are many sheets of beautifully silk-screened color pages in this, um, in this uh, album, which demonstrate Josef Elber's theories of the interactions of color. Josef Elber didn't so much put forward a color theory as a theory of the interactions of different colors. And this has been enormously influential on, um, on uh, artists and designers since that time. And here is a, is a pocket-sized version of this book, which is also from the library, the working library of the University of Manitoba. 
If we come over here, we see one of the silk screens from Joseph Albers' series on the square, and where he's playing with different interactions of color. There are literally hundreds of versions of this same configuration, the same visual configuration, but with different colors. One of the men that Joseph Albers taught was a, an American by the name of Kenneth Noland. And Kenneth Noland became an important artist in the circle um, of, um, of the American art critic, Clement Greenberg. Clement Greenberg, meanwhile, was invited to Regina by the, uh, the teacher at Regina College of the University of Saskatchewan, the art teacher there, a man from Ottawa by the name of Kenneth Lougheed. And this is one of Kenneth Lougheed's paintings. When Kenneth Noland came to the Emma Lake workshops, which were the summer workshops run by, 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 by Ken Lougheed and by others, and by Art, Art Mackay and other professors at the, at the Regina College, he taught these men, this is about 1963, he taught these people how to, um, this technique of painting um, onto raw, unsized canvas using acrylic paints. This is the technique that Kenneth Law had used in this painting, Orange Corner, which we have here in the collection of the University of Manitoba School of Art. Here is a work by Arthur Mackay, Kenneth Lougheed's uh, associate, which is done later. This is the, the former work I showed you, Orange Corners from 1964. This work is from the 1980s, but we see some of the same techniques being used here. If we return now to this wall here, I'm showing you paintings by Werner David Feist, who in addition to being a graphic artist was also a painter. This is a work we also have here uh, in the collection of the School of Art Gallery uh, uh, as a result of the generosity of, of Werner David uh, Feist's widow, Ursula Feist. And you can see some of the same interest in the interactions of color in this painting that we see and we saw in the other paintings. We also have a painting by Andor Weininger, who was a personal friend of Josef and Annie Albers. By the way, I should mention that Annie Albers was a, um, a textile artist with an enormous influence in the United States. As far as we know, she did not have Canadian students, but indirectly she did influence Canadian design through her publications. This painting, however, reiterates some of the interest in both color and the, the, the um, representation of geometric forms that was exhibited in Josef Albers' work, also the 1950s. On this wall, we have a, a grouping of other works. We have a work by Michael Snow, Michael Snow, one of the most important late 20th century Canadian artists, was strongly influenced by the work and ideas of Laszlo moholy nagy including moholy nagyas ideas on new media art. And on a kind of flexible type of way of showing works, if you look at this work here, you can see that there are, there are signatures on all four corners. And what Michael Snow meant by this was that you could turn the work around in any direction and you would still be able to appreciate it. This is a work by the Calgary artist, Ron Kostiniak, uh, who I'll be talking a little bit more about later. And this is a, a kinetic work of art, which is also inspired by optical art. And this is ultimately inspired by his interest in the, in the pioneering work by Laszlo moholy on kinetic light art, which is featured along with Joseph Albers in this display case here. The two last works here are made by two Montreal artists, Claude Toussignan and Guido Molinari. And both of these artists were students of Gordon Weber. I mentioned Gordon Weber earlier when I was speaking about the Institute of Design in Chicago. Gordon Weber, after he left the Institute of Design in Chicago and moved back to Canada, moved to Montreal, was hired by Arthur Lismer to teach the foundation course, to teach, um, I should say, children and uh, young adults at the, what was then known as the Montreal Art Association, is now the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Two of those students were Claude Toussignan and Guido Molinari. These two artists went on to become two of the most important Canadian artists of the late 20th century. They were co-founders of Les Plasticiens, the first group of geometric art, abstract artists in Canada. And you can see here that some of those principles, those Bauhaus principles of abstraction, of the interaction of color, are at play in these works as well, particularly in the work of Claude Toussignan, which if we 
think about in relation to these sheets from Joseph Albers' album, Interaction of Color, you can start to understand, although Claude Toussignan here adds the, the, uh, the, the dimension of concentric circles to the, to the uh, array in order to achieve the, the effects that he wants. In fact, if we look at this work by Claude Toussignan, if you just stare at the work, the interactions of the color start to vibrate, make your eyes vibrate, just like the actual kinetic dimension of this work by Ron Kostiniak make your, uh, influence your vision as well. I'd like to now turn our attention to the structurist, the structurist in Saskatoon. In 1943, there was a young American by the name of Eli Bornstein from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who was a student at the Milwaukee Teachers Training College, and their professor there took them to the Institute of Design in Chicago, not that far away from Milwaukee. So Eli Bornstein remembers, and he's about now 97 years old, he remembers uh, going there in 1943 and being received by Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, who spent hours, an entire afternoon, with these young students from the Milwaukee Teachers Training College. This left a very deep impression on Eli Bornstein, as did the work that he saw there by the students at the, at the Institute of Design. Actually, it was called the School of Design at that time. It changed names several times. Eli Bornstein was then hired by the University of Saskatchewan in 1950 as a temporary replacement for another professor. He ended up staying at the University of Saskatchewan, and indeed, he still lives in Saskatoon to this very day, so from 1950 onwards. In the mid-1950s, Eli Bornstein discovered the work of the, of the Minnesota artist um, um, Biederman, Charles Biederman, who had a theory about the relief as the kind of mode of art making of the future, inspired by Cezanne and by other artists. This may, way of making art, which, which Biederman termed structurist, was adapted by Eli Bornstein in his own work. And at the University of Saskatchewan, starting in about the late 50s, he established a veritable school of art named, that we now refer to as Canadian Structurism or Prairie Structurism. Two of his students were Liz Wilmot, Elizabeth Wilmot, and Ron Kostiniak, whose work is featured in this exhibition, along with the work of Eli Bornstein himself. We don't actually have any reliefs in the exhibition hall by Eli Bornstein, but there are two important reliefs on campus which uh, maybe you can have a look at uh, in, in this video uh, later on uh, that, uh, that are ex excellent examples of Eli Bornstein's work, including his most, one of his most important works, uh, Structures Relief in 15 Parts, which used to be installed in the International Airport in Winnipeg and is now installed on the south wall of the Max Bell Center here at the, on the University of Manitoba, Fort Geary campus. Here is an example of a Two-dimensional work by Eli Bornstein is from the 1980s. It's from his Arctic series. You can see in this work how he builds up, he builds the image up using color shapes. In the work of his students, Ron Kostiniak and Liz Wilmot, these three works, we can see how they are using colored three-dimensional relief elements that they combine in different ways and they intend the works to have both shadows and color reflections. So in this work by Elizabeth Wilmot, for example, I don't know if this will be visible on camera, but you have shadows, but you also have here, for example, the yellow reflection off of this uh, yellow plane. You have blue reflections or turquoise reflections off of this turquoise vertical element and so on. I'm also showing here a display cabinet about this remarkable journal entitled The Structurist. It was established by Eli Bornstein in 1960, and, it, and its final issue appeared this year. So it is the longest running Canadian art journal ever, 60 years. Its initial run was 50 years, then there was a 10 year hiatus, and it, it ended this year. There's also some correspondence between Eli Bornstein and Elizabeth Wilmot, and even an article by Dierit Kepesh, because uh, he, uh, Eli Bornstein was very interested in the modernist heritage, including the Bauhaus heritage, and he published much content on the Bauhaus in this Canadian art journal. If we come around here, we'll see a three-dimensional work by Ron Kostiniak. It is 
not so much a relief as a sculpture, but a sculpture that is about color interactions, color reflections, and color shadows, and therefore is closely related to the reliefs by, uh, to the, one of the works on display on the University of Manitoba campus by Eli Bornstein. In this work, entitled Lumina by Ron Kostiniak, we see an interest in both movement and in colored light. So we've seen in some of the other works how important the interactions of color are, the ideas of Joseph Albers. We've also briefly mentioned how important Laszlo Moholy-Nagy's ideas about movement and light were, especially in his famous work, The Light Prop from Electric Stage, otherwise known as the Light Space Modulator. That object itself was an enormous influence on both Jürg Kefesh and on, on, on Ron Kostinian. And here, if you look at this work, you can see that slowly the colors change uh, within these tubes. On this wall, I am featuring the work of a Canadian uh, Dene artist, Alex Jeanvier. Alex Jeanvier is, was a founder of the Professional Native Indian Artists Association Incorporated, and I think I got that wrong. Let's just call them the Indian Group of Seven. They had a very complicated name, who were founded here in Winnipeg in the 1970s by Daphne Ojig and a number of other indigenous artists. Alex Jeanvier is one of the most important living artists in Canada today. This is a silk screen by him from the 1970s, which was made here at the Grand Western Canadian Screen Print Shop in Winnipeg. Al Jeanvier's modus operandi was to take um, abstracted elements of Dene and, and Métis uh, mythology and incorporate them into his works, into his paintings, into his, into his graphic works of art. He's always said that he was inspired at art school in Calgary in the early 1960s and late 1950s by the work of the Bauhaus art professor Vasily Kandinsky. Here is an example of Vasily Kandinsky's work uh, from the late 1930s, but based on his work at the Bauhaus during the 1920s, where he took various abstracted forms and combined them and recombined them in various works. So this is a, a, a direct link between a Canadian indigenous artist and the Bauhaus tradition. Some of the other works we see around it are reference Vasily Kandinsky as well. In this work by Andor Weininger, made in Toronto, in Etobicoke, Toronto, uh, in the 1950s, we see Kandinsky's basic color shapes, which we saw at the introduction to this exhibition. The, the uh, blue circle, the red square, and the yellow triangle translated into the color shades of the 1950s and made into a three-dimensional relief actually before the structures began to make their relief art in Saskatoon. Next to that is an early relief work by Elizabeth Wilmot in yellows and shades of yellow. Another painting by Andor Weininger in the basic shades of red, yellow, and blue, but again translated into the shades, into the pastel colors of the 1950s. And finally, a, um, a relief work by Ron Kostiniak an early relief work by Ron Kostiniak, in this case, only with red and blue, the, the two of the three primaries, and white. The last section of the exhibition is devoted to Andor Weininger and some other related uh, themes. On this wall, we have a, a, um, um, a display of works by Andor Weininger and by Eva Fernbach Weininger. So there are a display of works of documents about them in Canada. We happen to have the largest collection of works by Andor Weininger uh, that he made in Canada in existence. There are other collections at the Art Gallery of Ontario and at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. We have close to 200 works by Andor Weininger in our collection. We only have a few of them on display here, but, uh, but they form a very important reason why I wanted to curate this exhibition here because we have this collection. We have a self-portrait here by Andor Weininger, made in Toronto in the 1950s, and a portrait of his wife, Eva Fernbach. And here we have a photographic reproduction, or I should say a digital reproduction of a photograph by Eva Fernbach Weininger of her husband, posed like a Group of Seven painting on the shores of a lake uh, in, in Algonquin Park in Ontario. And above this is a quotation from a letter that Andor Weininger sent to Walter Gropius and his wife, Isa Gropius, in 1951, in which he, he begins the letter by saying, 
Dear Gropius, dear Mrs. Gropius, we are reporting not from Miami, but from Mimico. Mimico was a, the name of the part of Etobicoke where, um, where Andor and Ava uh, Weininger were living at that time. The rest of the works on display on this wall relate to two themes. One is the influence of the Bauhaus artist Paul Clay on Canadian artists and Canadian art. And the other is the presence of, um, of Kurt Krantz, who was a graduate of the Bauhaus in Canada during the 1970s. Let's start with Kurt Krantz. Kurt Krantz came here in the early 1970s and had a number of exhibitions, including at the newly minted or fairly new Musée d'Art Contemporain in Montreal, but also um, at, at a private gallery in Toronto, at a museum in Hamilton, and at the Nickel Art Museum at the University of Calgary, where he also was an artist in residence for about three months in 1973. Among the people that he met there in 1973 was none other than Ron Kostiniak, who I've been speaking about uh, in this exhibition. We also have works by Andor Weininger, these, these two, this one as well, plus these, which are inspired either by Paul Clay, these three are inspired by Paul Clay, and these two by Oscar Schlemmer, one of the other uh, professors at the Bauhaus that Andor Weininger was very close to. Then we have three works done by, um, carried out by, by Kurt Krantz when he was in Canada or shortly after he was in Canada. He had a whole series that he entitled Calgary, actually. And these are very finely painted watercolors uh, in kind of um, uh, uh, narrow bands of color, which gradate from dark to light and from one color to the other, which are also inspired by the work of Paul Clay. And Paul Clay had a whole series of works like this done in the 1920s. Here we have another kind of grotesque work by, by Andor Weininger, also inspired by the work of Paul Clay. And finally, a work that displays the influence of Paul Clay by the Quebec modernist Alfred Pellon, who always said that he was strongly inspired by the work of Paul Clay. If we wrap around this corner finally, we see the last work in the exhibition, which is a work by Andor Weininger carried out in Mimico, Etobicoke, near Toronto in, the, in about 1953-54 which, in which we can see the way that he translates the primary colors and the geometric abstract art of the Bauhaus period into the style of the 1950s. And that brings us to the end of this exhibition. I just want to make one final point, and that is that the Bauhaus pedagogy had a huge influence on Canadian art design and architecture schools. And this was mainly through, not only through these, 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 uh, these people who went to the United States, studied with former Bauhaus people and came back, to United, came back to Canada, but also through the many pedagogical textbooks and other books that were published by Bauhaus people, mostly in the United States, by Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, by Josef Albers, Walter Gropius, Jared Kepesh, Sybil Moholy-Nagy, um, Ludwig Hilbersheimer, and Johannes Itten. These books were very widely distributed throughout the country, throughout Canada, um, and students use these books right into the 1980s. And the case of Josef Albers, they're using these publications to this very day. Thank you very much.